is my delight to introduce to you someone you already consider a friend and an ally, Representative Jim McGovern. Jim is sorry that he cannot be with us in person, but he will speak to us now on video, and we are grateful for that. Jim McGovern was elected to the House of Representatives in 1996, and since then has been a consistent and powerful voice for the most vulnerable. He serves on the House Rules Committee and co-chairs the Bipartisan Human Rights Commission, which investigates international human rights abuses and recommends how the U.S. should foster respect for democratic values abroad. As a leading advocate in Congress for peace, as we know, Jim has repeatedly called attention to the lack of congressional oversight and approval of America's wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Throughout his career, Jim has tirelessly advocated reallocating defense spending towards domestic priorities. Jim has also introduced several constitutional am amendments to overturn Citizens United. We are fortunate to have one of the most progressive, intelligent, and courageous elected officials as our Western Mass representative in Congress. And now, Jim McGovern on video. Hello. I want to thank the Western Massachusetts Democrats for taking the time to seriously examine the current tensions between the United States and North Korea and for inviting me to speak on the topic. I regret that I can't attend the discussion in person, but Congress is in session and voting today, and I have to be here in Washington. I don't believe that I've ever been so worried about a possible nuclear confrontation in my life. Using a nuclear weapon can be triggered very quickly and then escalate so rapidly that before we know it, we are in a nuclear war. National Command Authority, that is the power of the Commander-in-Chief to, to, to launch nuclear weapons, it's very simple. The President makes the decision to use nuclear weapons, and the Secretary of Defense executes that order. If that doesn't scare the hell out of you right now, I don't know what will. Once the decision is made and, and in the process of being carried out, our systems of checks and balances doesn't apply. Congress couldn't stop it. The Supreme Court couldn't stop it. And the way it's set up, not even the Secretary of Defense, in theory, has the authority to stop it. This is far from what the framers of the Constitution had in mind when they drafted and adopted this foundation of all our laws and democratic institutions. The framers, the framers gave the power to declare war to Congress. On North Korea, I'm proud to have joined with Congressman John Conyers of Michigan and Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts to introduce bipartisan, bicameral legislation to reaffirm Congress's constitutional power over a first strike on North Korea. H.R. 4140, the No Unconstitutional Strike Against North Korea Act, was introduced last week with 60 co-sponsors, two of them Republicans. The bill restricts any funds from being used to launch a military strike against North Korea without prior approval of Congress. That's any strike, not just nuclear. Because war is war is war. And only Congress has the right to declare war and authorize it. I was very proud to lead a letter addressed to President Trump with my good friends and colleagues John Conyers from Michigan and Barbara Lee from California, responding to the President's wildly erratic comments threatening military action against North Korea. 64 Democrats signed that letter. At the beginning of October, Congressman Seth Moulton uh, helped coordinate a letter also addressed to the President on the same topic, signed by 68 Democrats. That letter described a better approach to North Korea emphasizing diplomacy, economic pressure, and crisis management. You know, one of the things that also worries me is that I think President Trump actually believes that we have some kind of missile defense system that will just knock North Korea's nukes out of the sky when no such thing exists. And I'm also proud to be an original co-sponsor of H.R. 669, the House counterpart to S-200, the Restricting First Use of Nuclear Weapons Act, introduced by Congressman Ted Lieu of California and our own Ed Markey uh, in January of this year. This bill prohibits the president, and let me be clear, it prohibits any and every president from using the U.S. Armed Forces to carry out a first-use nuclear strike 
unless Congress has declared war and authorized such a first strike. The bill also clearly defines that first strike means that an enemy has not launched a nuclear weapon against the United States or an ally of the United States. If another country launches a nuke at us, the president does have the right to proportionate self-defense under international law. Um, and uh, some might argue that prohibiting the U.S. from striking first with a nuclear weapon ties the president's hands and makes the U.S. vulnerable to attack. Now, I know that former Secretary of Defense William Perry, who I met with last week, a true champion of rational nuclear disarmament, disarmament, has noted that there is no scenario where the U.S. military couldn't respond as a first strike with devastating force using our existing conventional arsenal. This includes our B-2 bombers, our cruise missiles, our tomahawks, our non-nuclear ICBMs, and a huge range of weaponry. We have seen the destructive capacity of our conventional first strike weapons in Iraq and Afghanistan, regardless of what we might individually think about those wars, and I want them to be ended as soon as humanly possible. So we are not weak or we are not vulnerable. Nuclear retaliation, let alone first strike, is not needed. Now let me say, for the record, the Democrats were strongly pushing President Obama to ad adopt a no first strike uh, policy when he was in office. So this is not about President Trump, or not just about him. But it will take many more co-sponsors for this bill to have any chance of moving in the House or Senate. It will take the Republican leadership of Congress being a lot more nervous about the possibility of the President actually launching a strike for them to advance these bills uh, in the House and the Senate. Meanwhile, we have the President backing away from the hard-won international agreement to keep nuclear weapons out of the hands of Iran. And we have him ex exchanging ever more heated taunts with a nuclear arm North Korea. This is why the Conyers Markey Bill on North Korea and the Markey Lu Bill on First Strike are so necessary. Congress needs to assert its constitutional authority not only when it comes to war, uh, and most especially when it comes to the catastrophic possibility of nuclear war. Now, I wish I could end on a more optimistic note, but I greatly fear that the Republican leaders of Congress will, act to rein, will, will not act to reign in this president. Perhaps a broad movement of engaged citizens, and I mean really big, could force this Congress to take common sense steps and assert its authority in these critical matters of war and peace. So I hope your discussion uh, might focus on, on how we can make that happen. These are incredibly important issues, uh, not just with regard to North Korea, but we ought to be having a, a discussion in this country and in the United Nations uh, about taking another step, and that is uh, the total abolition uh, of nuclear weapons. Um, you know, if nuclear weapons are ever used, we all lose. They, they will kill us all, either directly or eventually. Uh, and so we need to get back to focusing on uh, diplomacy, on sensible arms control, and on common sense policy. And I thank you very much for having me here tonight. Friends, we know that many of you are in regular contact with Jim, that you communicate with him. So we know that many of you will thank him on our behalf for his presentation and for being part of tonight's gathering via video. So that was pretty terrific. Our next speaker is Professor Michael Clare. Dr. Clare is the Five College Professor of Peace and World Security Studies based at Hampshire College and a preeminent scholar in the field of international relations. Dr. Clare is also the defense correspondent for The Nation magazine and serves on the board of directors of the Arms Control Association. A prolific writer, Dr. Clare is known internationally for his work on global security affairs. Dr. Michael Clare. Testing. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Good. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, as uh, Elizabeth Silver told you, we plan this with you in mind. Uh, to have an opportunity for our community to have a intense conversation about the issues that Jim McGovern just raised with us, the danger of war with North Korea. Uh, so my job as the first speaker 
is to set the context for our conversation, to provide some background, and then my colleagues here will address different aspects of that. So my job in the context is to ask first, what is the nature of the threat that we're talking about? How serious, how imminent? Where, and secondly, where are things headed? What are the po possible pathways ahead? Diplomatic and military. And finally, how can we, citizens of Northampton, influence the trajectory of events, moving the dial maybe more towards peace than war? So to begin, what is the nature of the threat that we face? And the threat or the danger that we all face, as I see it, is twofold. It has two dimensions. The first comes from North Korea, and that threat is that North Korea, we believe, is on the verge of acquiring the capacity to launch an intercontinental ballistic missile, an ICBM, with a warhead, a nuclear warhead, to launch that on U.S. territory. And this would make North Korea one of the very few countries in the world that would possess that very dangerous capacity. But the second threat, part of the threat, is that the U.S. government, led by President Trump, does not at this time appear to have a viable strategy to prevent that from occurring short of military action, which in turn could lead to North Korean military retaliation, which could involve conventional attacks on a massive scale, which could incinerate the South Korean capital of Seoul, or the use of chemical or biological weapons or nuclear weapons, resulting in the death of tens, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of people in South Korea and Japan, including US soldiers that are stationed there, their families, and Americans living in the region. So that's the situation in a nutshell. And I will begin now to uh, unpack this a bit. So first, the North Korean side of this equation. And this has two dimensions, a political, a political strategic dimension <coughs> and a military technological aspect. So I'll begin with the political strategic dimension. And what do I mean by this? North Korea wouldn't be threatening the United States with nuclear-armed ICBMs if its leaders, and, I, and we're really talking about the Kim family, do not perceive a political strategic purpose for doing so. I don't have the time to spend a lot of, lot of time on what this is. There's been a lot of speculation about this, and there's a lot that we don't know. But in essence, the Kim Dynasty of North Korea, and that began with Kim Il-sung, the founder, the creator of the state of North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK, his son, Kim Jong-il, and his grandson, the current leader, Kim Jong-un, have always feared invasion from the South, from South Korea, backed by the United States, the overthrow of their regime, and presumably their death as well. Now, whether this is a reasonable fear on their part, or sheer paranoia, or both, is a long discussion. But North Korean officials believe that this is a reasonable fear, and they point to the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq and the 2011 U.S. intervention in Libya which resulted in the execution of Saddam Hussein in the first case and Muammar Gaddafi in the second as evidence for their claims that they face a legitimate threat. In any case, the Kims have concluded that the only way to deter or prevent such action by the US and its allies was to acquire nuclear, a nuclear retaliatory capability so as to say, if you attack us, we will incinerate Honolulu or Los Angeles or San Francisco. So don't even think about it. That's the best we can interpret, I believe, 
their motives for doing this. But we could talk more about uh, for building this arsenal. We could talk more about that in the Q and A. That's the political, uh, strategic dimension. The second part is the technological, military part, or acquiring the means to mount such a threat. This is not an easy, overnight sort of operation. The Kims have methodically, over many years and decades, put together the components of a nuclear ICBM capability with nuclear warheads, probably with some help from their friends, Russia and China, which don't want to see the North Korean regime overthrown and replaced by a US-backed, uh, all-peninsula South Korean type government. In any case, they've spent decades at this. And there are multiple elements of this weapons effort. They need the nuclear warhead part and the ballistic missile part. I'm not going to go into the full background on this, and my colleague Tom Countryman knows more about this than I do, so you can direct questions to him. But it requires, first of all, having enough fissile material, explosive nuclear material for a bomb. Uh, secondly, figuring out how to detonate a nuclear device. Third, how to configure an explosive device small enough to fit on the nose cone of an ICBM. And then to build ICBMs with the range to strike U.S. territory. Those are complicated uh, technical um, engineering feats that require a lot of effort. So where do they stand today? Um, this is what I believe from the open source literature. Uh, we believe they've accumulated enough fissile material for somewhere between 10 and 20 warheads. Uh, maybe uh, Tom Countryman uh, could, could tell us more about this, but somewhere in that range. They've conducted six underground tests of nuclear devices, so we know they're capable of creating an explosive device. The most recently was in September, and it was quite a large explosive device, as many as 100 kilotons, uh, five times or more the Hiroshima weapon. And in July, they tested an ICBM that could conceivably reach Alaska and the far western United States. So they have far the capability. What they have not done yet, and this is very important for us to understand, they have not yet tested a nuclear device that could fit on a nose cone and survive the flight into space and then back into uh, the atmosphere. That's a very demanding part of this process. And we don't know exactly how close they are to that critical capability. So they have not completed everything that they need. Once they do that successfully, the threat to the US will be very real. But they haven't achieved that yet, so the question still remains how to prevent that from occurring. Now, as I stated at the outset, our problem is twofold the threat from North Korea, and the failure from Washington. As I indicated, the Kims have been assembling this deadly capacity over many decades. Accordingly, the United States has had many years in which to negotiate an arrangement with North Korea to eliminate the threat of nuclear-armed ICBMs at a very early stage. Such an arrangement would have required direct talks with the North Korean leadership, and secondly, guarantees on the US side that the Kim family would not be put at risk. Now, I agree that these are very unpalatable choices for the US. The Kims have been brutal dictators and have treated their people terribly. There's no question about it. So meeting with them, agreeing to some of their demands, that was always going to be a very hard choice for American presidents, and I understand their reluctance to do that.
But U.S. leaders have met and negotiated with unpalatable leaders before, with Khrushchev and Brezhnev during the Cold War era, with Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, and with Vladimir Putin and Duterte of the Philippines just a few days ago. So not an impossible task to sit down and talk with unpalatable leaders and negotiate American interests. But somehow American leaders have found it very difficult to do that, to go the extra mile, to talk with the Kims. And I think there's the Democrats and Republicans alike. And so uh, we find ourselves in this difficult situation today. Now it's true that attempts have been made. And uh, if time allows, I could go into them. There was an effort in 1994 with the agreed framework calling for the dismantling of North Korean nuclear weapons. And again in 2005 with the so-called Six Power Talks involving the US as well as Russia, China, the two Koreas, and Japan. Both of those ended in failure. I think if a greater effort had been made Maybe they could have succeeded. But the effort that I think would have been required uh, was never made to sit down face to face between US and North Korean leaders, the Kims. That never occurred. Uh, and to meet their requirements for safety, that path was never chosen. Instead, American presidents, Republicans and Democrats alike chose a course of isolation, the demonization, and extreme economic pressure. No country has been subjected to more economic sanctions than North Korea or more vilification. And this has escalated under the current president. But while all this might feel good and provide a sense of doing something, it has achieved absolutely nothing, zilch in terms of slowing the North Korean nuclear and missile drive. And so this brings us to the present moment. North Korea is on the verge of deploying nuclear-tipped ICBMs capable of striking this country. And so far as I could see, there are no negotiations underway to prevent that from happening. Only talk of war. Now, as I said, uh, North Korea is on the verge of a, a striking weapons that could reach the U.S. That does not mean, I believe, that Kim Jong-un has any intention of launching them against the USA in a premeditated first strike attack. That's the last thing I think he would do, knowing the U.S. would respond automatically with a weapons barrage on our own side, destroying his country and him. That's not my worry. My worry is that Kim would respond to some future move against his regime by the US or South Korea at a lower level that he would interpret it as a attack on his regime and so respond. And we've heard from South Korea talk of a decapitation plan to uh, send forces into the North to kill Kim and his close advisors in some future crisis. If something like that were to occur, and he had nuclear weapons, then I fear he would use them. So that is the worry. So preventing Kim from achieving this final step of achieving this ability to uh, fire uh, weapons to achieve the capacity is of utmost importance. And I think there's still time to achieve a negotiated solution if the president sits down with Kim and agrees to a some kind of arrangement leading to comprehensive talks. Now, it, beginning with a demand of to, the total denuclearization of the North is not going to work. We have to begin with talks on freezing North Korea's testing. If they can't test 
they cannot complete that ultimate step. So talks about a freeze with some compensating US and South Korean moves to lower the level of, of threat to the North, if we could do that, I believe it's possible to avert war. But uh, I see no signs that uh, the Trump administration is prepared to engage in such delicate negotiations. Instead, his inclination, as we have seen, is to bully and bluster and to issue threats to annihilate North Korea. And if he keeps, and so he keeps this threat. Now, there's been a lot of talk about what such an operation might entail. And I'll finish by talking about uh, what, what a military operation might entail if that were to happen. And this could happen starting tomorrow. Uh, bear in mind that there are now three aircraft carrier battle groups in the Pacific region, as, long as, as well as other reinforcements from the United States. I'm not saying that I believe that this is going to happen, but uh, the U.S. Is prepared, is prepared to use, to conduct military strikes if the president orders it. What might that entail? The Library of Congress has just come out with a report on the North Korean nuclear challenge, military options and issues for Congress, dated October 27th. You can get this online, and they go through a range of different military scenarios. They all end the same way, with whether it's a small little pinprick attack by the United States to knock out some launchers using conventional weapons, or all-out attack, they all end in the same way with North Korea retaliating using artillery barrages on Seoul or chemical and biological weapons or nuclear weapons and tens, hundreds, or millions of thousands of people killed. That's all, all of the scenarios end that way. So I think that we have to absolutely rule out any kind, there is no safe military option. And we have to make that very clear to Washington, as Jim McGovern said. There is no military option. The only option is a negotiated option. And so we have to do everything we can to promote a peaceful option. And I think that means reaching out to members of Congress, as you heard, I mean, we don't have to convince Jim McGovern, but we have to convince other members of Congress, as he said, about the risks of a military option, and make clear that Americans living in South Korea and Japan are going to be among those who will suffer from any such scenario. And I hope that as we proceed in our discussion, we can explore the various ways we in Northampton, Northampton can make that voice heard. But I think that it's time for me to stop and to let you hear from my colleagues. And I hope that my uh, presentation gives you a sense of just how serious the danger is and why we all need to focus on this. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll now turn to the next presenter. Thank you, Michael. Our next presenter is Dr. Yasutomo. Professor Dennis Yasutomo is the Esther Cloudman Dunn Professor of Government at Smith College and specializes in contemporary Japanese foreign policy. Dr. Yasutomo has written extensively on the complex relations in the Asia-Pacific region. Thank you very much, Dr. Yasutomo. Thank you. First, uh, first I would just like to uh, pull it closer. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Sounds like a commercial. <laughs> uh, I would first like to thank uh, Michael and the organizers of this sponsor. Could you put that microphone closer, please? Michael, it's right next to you. Can you hear this better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, the sponsors for uh, asking me to participate on this very important uh, uh, panel. Um, Michael challenged us this evening, uh, I know, to ask, to answer the question, how can we get out of this mess with North Korea? And uh, to be very honest with you, my first response was, did you know that GEICO offers 50% on your car insurance? <laughs> In truth, uh, I don't really know the answer. Um, but what I hope to bring to the table tonight is something that we do not get very much of um, in the American media, which is a better idea of what's going on among North Korea's neighbors, namely China, Japan, and South Korea. Um, you know, we are so focused here on North Korea uh, and on what the Americans are doing, but um, I think some of the solutions to this lie outside of uh, those two countries. Uh, it lies in what's going on in Asia today. And I would like to sort of integrate um, many of the things I hear coming out of Asia, both on visits and uh, through the media and through contacts, because I think they provide a, a slightly different perspective uh, than some of the things you hear uh, here. Um, <clears throat> I was struck uh, by a comment that was made to me recently that the farther away you are from East Asia, the more panicked you are about North Korea. Um, from a distance, you see the storm clouds gathering. Uh, but if you live in East Asia, you may be nervous, but you also see things happening that maybe give you a little bit of hope. Um, and this is ironic because when I was in Asia last year, this is not what I was hearing. When I was there last summer, I kept hearing, something's happening with Kim. You know, there's something wrong here. North Korea is getting more aggressive, you know, something's up. And then the um, test began and the missiles started to fly and the concerns started to rise. Um, this year, uh, my sense is that some Asian observers feel that North Korea has achieved its original objectives, uh, which is that North Korea uh, now feels it has enough nuclear power to make adversaries think twice before attacking them. Um, they feel that perhaps um, we understand that there will be a terrible price to pay if the regime change is our objective and that um, we don't want to pay that price. So North Korea may feel that their brinkmanship strategy has worked and that they are a little safer now uh, than they were last year. And that it may be time for them to focus a little bit more on their economic development because their nuclear program and their military buildup has drained their resources, uh, which have been meager to begin with. Uh, Korea watchers, um, ironically, um, are pointing out that the North Korean economy is growing. And in fact, in the last uh, year, the past year, it's been growing three to five percent. Um, so it's at this juncture that um, North Korea has been hit with tougher sanctions that are taking a toll. And this pushes North Korea, according to some people, to feel even more isolated and threatened because economic collapse also um, uh, suggests regime change. And therefore, um, they are <clears throat> acting more belligerent by relying on their enhanced nuclear power. So this is a view of a rational North Korea. Uh, we hear that they watch CNN and Morning Joe uh, and that they're trying to figure out Trump. Um, so no, so we know they're rational because we're doing the same thing. Um, so this is a view that North Korea is carefully calibrating uh, a brinkmanship diplomacy to ensure the survival of the regime and to attain global recognition as a member of the elite nuclear club. This does not <coughs> include a North Korean misjudgments and the possibility of inadvertent conflict, uh, but it does suggest that North Korea can be contained and deterred through diplomatic methods. What complicates matters sometimes is something that we're all starting to realize, uh, and that is the cultural uh, aspect of all of this um, you know, Asian diplomacy. The media loves to focus on name calling and to tell us about what Asian hosts put on the table for Trump to eat. 
um, but next to nothing about what Trump put on the table for a deal with North Korea. Um, and yeah, it's amusing, but you know, these things do offer sometimes clues uh, about uh, what's going on. And so I, I guess I have a hard time um, ignoring the potent mix of nationalism, personalism, and face saving uh, in Asian diplomacy that can be contributing factors. Um, I'm not going to discuss name calling, but I will discuss a little bit about Asian food and things of that nature because we do learn things from what's going on there at these uh, state dinners. Uh, <clears throat> this is a long-winded way of saying that um, this sets the stage for um, the diplomacy that is now occurring among China, uh, South Korea, and Japan. So I'm going to look at nukes, economics, and uh, diplomacy within a cultural framework as well. I think what's notable is that China, South Korea, and Japan seem to be moving a little bit more in sync diplomatically in North Korea, despite the troubled relationship among them and despite the differences in their positions on North Korea. Um, they seem to be starting to agree on sanctioning, containing, and deterring North Korea, and also on perhaps reining in and channeling the United States a little bit more with the objective, perhaps, of maintaining the status quo. Uh, they disagree on how to do this on, and the long-term objectives. Um, China has been assigned almost sole responsibility for North Korea uh, by the U.S. and others, but China's relationship with North Korea is not good, and Sino-American relations are unpredictable and over the long run adversarial. China has stepped up its sanctions uh, on North Korea. Uh, Beijing has reduced uh, imports from North Korea, including coal. It has curtailed, um, it, it has continued the flow of, um, you know, some items uh, like oil and fuel. Um, Chinese exports uh, have continued with cell phones and computers, motorcycles, some food stuff. So North Korea is developing a trade deficit uh, with China. There are reports that Chinese banks along the border have stopped dealing with North Korea, and North Korean laborers in China uh, are not having their contracts renewed by Chinese companies, uh, which is a UN sanction. So North Korea is telling them to stay in China, get other jobs, and keep sending money home. So North Korea is being squeezed, but I think that everyone there feels that sanctions are not the answer. Um, North Korea has uh, reportedly <coughs> stockpiled or hoarded enough oil for a year. North Korea manages to earn money from uh, illegal sales of small arms and live weapons, illicit drugs. Um, they have cyber attacks on financial institutions to steal money and, you know, other methods. So it's unlikely um, that China will continue sanctions uh, hard enough or push sanctions hard enough uh, because they have no intention of causing the collapse of North Korea, and in fact, no one in Asia wants this, neither China, Japan, nor South Korea. So China is doing just enough to fend off criticisms that it's not doing enough, but it's not doing enough to cause North Korea to collapse. However, China is doing other things um, that are more interesting. First, China and South Korea have mended fences uh, for now. Um, their relationship was in deep freeze for the past year because the previous South Korean government okayed the partial deployment of missiles in the South under the so-called THAAD uh, program, the Terminal High Altitude Air Defense Program. Um, <clears throat> China thought it was aimed at them and not North Korea. It could not talk to South Koreans out of uh, deploying some missiles, so China leveled sanctions against South Korea uh, as well as North Korea. It halted Chinese tourism and made it difficult for Korean companies to do business in Japan, and um, it has hurt the Chinese, uh, the Korean economy. So both Koreas have been hit by sanctions. Um, <clears throat> however, the new Korean government under President Moon has taken a softer engagement line toward North Korea and worked out an agreement uh, with China. Uh, no new THAAD missiles will be deployed. South Korea will not join the U.S. in a missile defense system, and South Korea will not join Japan and the U.S. in a trilateral military alliance. What this um, thaw may do is to strengthen China's hand against North Korea by making South Korea seem less of a threat to the North. 
Um, it would uh, stymie closer cooperation between South Korea and the U.S. and Japan, which would suit China as well because it would drive a wedge between South Korea and the U.S. Um, the U.S. is already wary of South Korea's known preference for engagement and economic cooperation with North Korea. I think the U.S. sees this as kind of a Korean South Korean version of uh, strategic patience. So it would not be happy if South Korea decoupled itself from U.S. security efforts. Now, South Korea said, U.S., don't worry, but three days ago, the South Koreans refused to join a military exercise with the U.S. because the Japanese military would be participating. Um, this was considered a gesture towards China uh, as it tries, South Korea tries to balance between China and the U.S. But for now, um, this means that China and South Korea can cooperate more closely toward North Korea with an approach that leans a little bit more toward engagement. So advantage, probably China. The relationship between China and Japan is also thawing. Uh, as you probably know, there are underlying historical, territorial, and other issues uh, between them going back forever. Um, but Prime Minister Abe and President Xi have just declared, quote, a new start again. Um, so cooperation between Japan and China is essential because they do take opposite positions on North Korea. Japan takes the toughest line of, every, of anyone there uh, against North Korea, fueled in part by this weird issue of Japanese citizens who were abducted by North Korean agents and taken to North Korea since the 1970s. Now, Trump met the parents uh, of one of those abductees. Um, and Prime Minister Abe probably has the strongest personal relationship with Trump uh, of any foreign leader. So we know that Trump seems to have been schooled in North Korea uh, by both Abe and Xi. And now both China and Japan agree on sanctions and both agree that North Korea uh, should not be allowed to collapse. Now, it is true, as you know, that uh, Japan has declared support for the U.S. position that all options are on the table. Um, you can interpret that as, in the U.S. as obvious support for a potential preemptive strike on North Korea, but um, I think if you talk with uh, some Japanese, um, it's really interpreted there as a call for uh, tougher sanctions. I think um, the Japanese understand full well um, that they can call for tougher sanctions because there's still give, that there's still a lot of room to squeeze North Korea without uh, causing it to collapse. So, um, Xi and Abe may have uh, been able to close their differences a little uh, on North Korea with the hope that Trump listens to them. Um, the other dimension is that China and Japan are getting closer on trade issues, um, with the U.S. and Japan sort of drifting apart a, a little bit. Trump wants a bilateral free trade agreement. Japan prefers multilateral free trade regimes, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership that Trump torpedoed uh, on day three in office. But as you may know, TPP rose from the dead in Vietnam when Trump was there, led by efforts uh, including Japan. But Trump has a funny way of dealing with Japan on trade. Um, at a public news conference, uh, he told Japan there's nothing wrong with settling for number two status in front of the great U.S. economy. <laughs> and then he asked why a samurai warrior nation could not shoot down a North Korean missile. Um, the simple answer is that Japan has not been defended by samurai since the 19th century. Uh, <clears throat> but it did hit a sore spot uh, because J Japanese missiles currently, the PAC-3s, have a range of something like 20 miles and cannot intercept an incoming uh, missile until it's on a downward trajectory, so you better not miss. So Trump then suggested that the answer would be to buy lots and lots of U.S. weapons. So he relegates Japan to a subordinate position economically as an unfair trader, um, and he makes fun of their ability to defend their country, and of course this all makes a nationalist prime minister very happy. Uh, <coughs> China has emerged as the premier advocate for multilateral free trade, and Japan understands that its economic future must include China. So it may be significant uh, that China and Japan can work together on both North Korea and trade. 
So if Japan, which is a strong US ally, is also doing a little bit of balancing, then advantage China, for now, maybe. Um, <clears throat> Japan and South Korea uh, is the third leg of the triangle, and this is the most problematic leg when it comes to North Korea. Uh, South Korea complained that Trump was staying in Japan three days and in Korea only two days, and so they reportedly asked Trump to stay an extra day in Seoul. Uh, the Trump camp said um, he is not going to stay an extra day in Seoul, but on day three in Tokyo, he will not conduct official business with the Japanese. Um, South Korea then served Trump uh, shrimp that was harvested from the waters surrounding an island that Japan also claims, and then invited a comfort woman to the state dinner, a seated at the head table. Um, I'm told that Ivanka, uh, given a, giving a speech in Tokyo and then going home without visiting South Korea, did not go unnoticed. So Trump met with parents of a Japanese abductee in Tokyo and found himself meeting a Korean comfort woman in Seoul. Um, Seoul really doesn't like the Abe-Trump bromance, so this was a message to both Tokyo and to Trump. Uh, so Trump got a lesson in Asian nationalism, personalism, and saving face. Uh, full force. And this brings me back to the earlier observation about being far away from East Asia because the question is would South Korea be doing this, these kinds of things, if it was fearful of an existential threat from North Korea? You would think they would be reaching out and tightening their relationships with the U.S. and with Japan. Uh, you know, why do this with allies, you know, that you may need in a crisis? So, <clears throat> the U.S. is always trying to get um, these two countries to cooperate better, but it's tough. Uh, and so with China making nice with both South Korea and Japan, and with the U.S. having trouble with South Korea over its close bond with Japan, and with South Korea going back and forth with the U.S. and keeping Japan at bay, advantage China maybe? Um, so maybe we should take all of these movements with a grain of salt. I mean, much of uh, Asian diplomacy can be theater. Uh, but the question is, will these movements provide enough cover to enable us to move beyond the current stalemate? Uh, and if so, what all of this suggests is that China is emerging as the pivot for international relations in Asia surrounding the North Korea issue. China now seems to be the indispensable country on North Korea dip uh, diplomatically. The U.S. wanted China to take a leadership role, and China seems to be doing this but in its own way, trying to get South Korea and Japan behind it, at least on this one issue, for leverage against North Korea. And if you notice, if you read the news this morning, uh, you see that China is going to be sending an envoy to Beijing, uh, to Pyongyang on Friday. Um, this comes after Kim sent a con congratulatory note uh, to China on the October Party Congress. And I can't help but feel that what I just described set the stage uh, for this visit uh, and dialogue on Friday. The thing to remember is that China has come up with a global vision uh, for its role in the world. Uh, Beijing envisions um, economic corridors stretching from the mainland of Asia um, across the sea lanes of the Indo-Pacific region, stretching all the way to the Middle East, to Europe, and down to Africa. Um, it's created new multilateral institutions in Asia. It has become the primary <coughs> proponent of free trade agreements and the Climate Change Accord. Uh, it is talking about a new way of conducting international relations different from Western ways of inter interstate relations and economic development. So it's really not hard to think that China finds it bothersome to have to deal with a pesky North Korean neighbor next door uh, and an angry uh, at that. So, you know, there is a kind of sense here that China would just like to settle this and move on. Um, and the irony here is that China is moving, you know, outward, you know, far beyond its backyard and thinking strategically, globally, and long term as a rising power, while the U.S. is thinking reactively, regionally, and short term as a way of making America great. So, uh, thank you very much.
Our next speaker is Mr. Tom Countryman. Mr. Countryman was recently elected the chair of the board of the Arms Control Association, a nonprofit information and policy analysis organization in Washington, D.C. Until January, Mr. Countryman was the Assistant Secretary of State for Nonproliferation Affairs and also the Acting Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. <clears throat> Mr. Countryman arrived from D.C. in Northampton this afternoon to speak to us tonight. We are honored to have you with us. Thank you so much, Mr. Countryman. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to give my 15 minutes back to Dennis. I thought that was <laughs> uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, I think it is a remarkable statement about Northampton and about your interest in your world that extends well beyond your city and the state of and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I salute you for it. It's a real honor for me to be here. The Arms Control Association is a very small NGO. Uh, that's a not so subtle advertisement for more donors and more <laughs> members, and there's information outside. Uh, but we are nonpartisan, and we attempt to demonstrate that a commitment to United States national security is absolutely consistent with the goal of reducing the threat of nuclear or chemical or biological conflict globally. So we pursue both goals. Um, and with that in mind, let me build upon the last two speakers to uh, say a little bit about why North Korea is dangerous and what especially concerns me about the current situation. Uh, I like to say that there are three big arms control issues in the world right now. The most important one is our relationship with Russia and the future of arms control between Moscow and Washington. The most urgent one is North Korea for reasons that have already been described and that I'll expand upon. And the most unnecessary, or if you prefer, the stupidest one, is Iran, because there's absolutely no reason other than an arbitrary choice of the White House that we have to be worried about Iran's nuclear capability at this moment. But let's stick with tonight's topic, why North Korea is the most dangerous. Uh, we've already talked, heard, heard a little bit about their capabilities. They've done six nuclear tests. They are committed to a systematic program of testing and improving nuclear weapons based upon the same way that the United States, the Soviet Union, the British, the French, and the Chinese went about their program. You have to test to get better at it. Their latest test shows uh, a warhead, or uh, rather a device that, uh, as Michael noted, is several times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945. The number of warheads that they might possess is absolutely unknown. The number of devices they built, we can't know. But intelligence experts like to guesstimate how much plutonium and how much enriched uranium, highly enriched uranium, the two different pathways for making a nuclear weapon they could have produced. And the answer tells you that they have somewhere between 20 and 60, and potentially in the near future, enough material for up to 100 warheads. Um, they are expanding, again, in a systematic way, the same way other countries have done it. The range, the capability, and the accuracy of their ballistic missiles. Uh, there, we have no information as to whether they have yet perfected a re-entry vehicle that can protect a miniaturized nuclear device in its re-entry into the atmosphere. Uh, we just don't know that, but it is 
I hope you understand why, the responsibility not just of the president, but of the military and the intelligence agencies to assume that they are damn close to having that capability. It leaves a great deal, therefore, as they have developed capabilities, it leaves a great deal to say about what is their intent, what is the purpose of North Korea continuing to pursue these, and I'll say a couple of words about that. Uh, I think Michael had it right that their primary goal is the survival of a regime that exemplifies communism in one family, uh, that melds a Stalinist type of communism with a very Korean tradition of dynastic leadership. And they realize that they are poor and weak compared to neighbors such as South Korea, China, and Russia, and that they are out of step with the rest of the world when it comes to continuing uh, this kind of, uh, I don't care whether you call it Stalinism or fascism, they are both accurate descriptions of the North Korean regime. And therefore, to preserve the survival of the regime, they are counting upon having a nuclear weapon that is a credible threat to the United States that will deter the United States from any serious action to overthrow the regime in Pyongyang. Uh, the, um, we'll talk perhaps a little more about their motivations as we go forward. Here's why I think that the current situation is dangerous. That the United States has not pursued what President Trump described in April as a strategy of maximum pressure and maximum engagement. There has been maximum pressure. There have been some good steps taken by the United States in step with other partners, particularly China, that increase economic pressure on the government in Pyongyang, and I strongly support those. We have not seen any evidence of the second part of the declared strategy, which is maximum engagement with the North Koreans. And in fact, the President has undercut efforts by my old colleagues at the State Department, as well as by his own Secretary of State, Mr. Tillerson, to pursue engagement. Uh, I argue for diplomacy because I know from 35 years experience that it works. It doesn't always work. It often fails until it works. But there are enough situations, not just in which it has temporarily got the North Koreans to stop, to make an agreement, to do something rational, to open a chance for a better agreement. That's happened three times in the last 30 years. But I've seen enough situations where diplomacy <coughs> prevented a situation that otherwise could have required the U.S. to act with military force and to put our servicemen at risk. Diplomacy, I believe, should always be the first resort uh, rather than the last resort. Uh, I'm especially disappointed by the approach I've seen this year. I'm used to the leader of North Korea or the previous president of Iran saying outrageous, irrational, insulting things at the United Nations and elsewhere. Uh, I'm disappointed when the U.S. president stoops to the same level of trading vulgarities. And in particular, it diminishes the United States in the eyes of the rest of the world, not just the people that you're insulting, but U.S. allies as well, who have come to believe that the U.S., for all of its faults, for all of its inconsistency, is a credible leader of the democratic world. And when you add to that this president's readiness to abandon every agreement that his predecessor signed, you have diminished U.S. credibility and diminished ability for the United States to conclude any kind of agreement, not just about nuclear weapons, but about trade or counterterrorism or any other topic 
and not just with our adversaries or our rivals, but with our allies as well. Uh, and I think Dennis described some of that dynamic at work the past week on the President's trip to Asia. I'm concerned because I can picture so many ways that this scenario could spin out of control and rapidly rise to the risk of nuclear, an, an exchange of nuclear weapons, either in one direction or both directions. Uh, I think the likelihood of the President ordering a nuclear strike on North Korea, whether an all-out strike or a more limited one, is small, but it is not zero. It is possible that this is on the President's menu of choices today. Uh, similarly, I think at the other extreme, the idea that North Korea would order a nuclear attack on any of its neighbors or on the United States without any kind of provocation is even smaller. But it's not zero. And as I said, it's not something that any president of the United States can afford to assume is zero. And in between those, there are a number of scenarios under which a conventional attack, a conventional provocation, a reaction to a misinterpreted signal sent from one side or the other could rapidly grow into an exchange, as Michael noted, of not only nuclear weapons, but as uh, uh, has been confirmed by the Pentagon. He noted the Library of Congress study, which is very interesting. Just last week, the Joint Chiefs of Staff replied to a congressional letter by saying, yes, in any scenario of conflict, North Korea has the capability to inflict hundreds of thousands of casualties in the metropolitan Seoul <coughs> area within the first day. Uh, and that there is essentially no way to avoid it. I encourage you to read this letter from the military, um, from the Joint Chiefs to the Congress. So there's more than one scenario that gets you intentionally or accidentally, if not to an all-out nuclear exchange, to a situation of war on the Korean Peninsula, where hundreds and thousands of our allied citizens are killed within the first few days and thousands of Americans, by the way, at the same time. I say all this because I think that there is a tendency to believe that rocket science or arms control science is an exact science. It is not. It is subject to the same vacillations, fluctuations, and just plain perversion of, Amer of human behavior that any other political science is subject to. And in calculating, in developing strategic deterrence, in figuring out how to keep China, which by the way, 50 years ago this week looked exactly like North Korea does today, that is on the verge of developing nuclear weapons, and with a communist leader who many in Washington thought was crazy. How do we keep China and Russia from unleashing their nuclear arsenal, each of them a thousand times more destructive than North Korea's, upon the US? Well, we've got years of experience in doing that. But we came very close 55 years ago in October of 1962 to an accidental conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. And some of you will remember it firsthand. Uh, but I think what is not remembered by most Americans, because it's only been revealed in the last few years, is how drastically Fidel Castro misunderstood what John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev were doing how drastically Kennedy misunderstood what Castro was after. Khrushchev misunderstood Castro. We were damn lucky that there was no nuclear exchange in 1962, and it wasn't a matter 
of just sheer brilliance on the part of Kennedy and Khrushchev. It was rather, uh, what I want to attribute our good luck to is that Kennedy made sure that he was communicating directly and respectfully to Nikita Khrushchev. He did not assume, he did not make the most dangerous assumption you can make, which is to say, I know exactly how my adversary is going to react. He did not assume, he did not make another dangerous mistake, which is to assume my adversary is just plain crazy and unpredictable. But he didn't think, I know exactly what he's going to do at every moment. Rather, he focused on communicating clearly what we would do, what our priorities were, and to do that directly, respectfully, and privately. He worked hard to make sure that messages across the U.S. government were calibrated in that way. And still, we got through that by the skin of our teeth. That's what worries me today because I don't think that we have a person capable of the same careful approach to North Korea. Uh, I think that we have massive, fragile egos at the head of two governments who are really incapable of judging accurately what the other will do, but capable of taking offense very readily. Uh, and so, uh, in the end, uh, this is what worries me perhaps the most, more than the technical characteristics. Uh, we can talk a lot more about not just pieces of legislation that Congressman McGovern mentioned, and there are others as well that deserve your attention, uh, but a little more about the role of China, which is fascinating. Let me just leave you with President Kennedy's own conclusion drawn after the, the Cuban Missile Crisis was over because it should be our guidepost today. He said, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to the choice of either a humiliating defeat or a nuclear war. I would hope that could be the guidance for our leadership today. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. And now it's time for our lively back and forth, the question and answer. The purpose of this time of our exchange is to maximize the opportunity for many of you to raise questions and hear directly from our panelists about your concerns. With that in mind, I want to stress that we want to hear many voices and we want to have our panelists be able to respond to many questions. So these requests, please. If you would like to ask a question, please make it a question. No narratives, little speeches, or sermonettes. Each, each question should be short. Please ask only one question and make sure your question is relevant to tonight's focus. It is helpful if you direct your question to a specific panelist. If a similar question has already been asked as the one you have in mind, please don't repeat that same question. The floor is now open for your questions, and Elizabeth will be standing at this floor mic. You can come forward and line up right here if you want to ask a question. The floor is open now. Hi, panelists. Um, so, like you said before, North Korea understands that if they strike South Korea or Japan, that there's nothing saving them from being totally annihilated. So. Do you see a path of how North Korea could go about potentially destroying other countries without destroying themselves, or is this similar to um, in the Cold War with Russia and the United States as mutually assured destruction ensured that there would no, be no nuclear strikes? Um, I would say short answer is no. Uh, there is no chance North Korea could wage all-out war on anybody without committing suicide. Uh, that's the promise from Seoul and Washington, and I think it's an appropriate promise for Seoul and Washington to make. Uh, what I do worry about is once 
the uh, beloved Marshal uh, Kim Jong-un is confident that he has a nuclear weapon that could reach the United States, he will become more adventurous in the conventional sense and believe that he can go about uh, sinking a ship or shelling an island or shooting down a plane uh, doing this kind of stuff just to demonstrate at home that he's a strong leader and calculating that the U.S. will not react because of his possession of nuclear weapons. That's one of the long-term dangerous scenarios, not just in the immediate moment, but in the next several years to come that we could worry about. Thank you very much. My name is Martin Jones, I live in Northampton, and my question is for Mr. Countryman. Uh, in 1998, uh, Pakistan became the seventh declared nuclear power. And at the time, uh, President Bill Clinton said that they were repeating some of the worst mistakes of the 20th century. So I want to ask, do you believe it was a mistake for the United States to develop the atomic bomb? And in hindsight, considering all that's developed since then, as a result, what could the United States do to correct that mistake? It's a pretty cosmic question. Uh, the, uh, uh, boy, you need a better philosopher than me. Um, I don't think it was a mistake because there were countries with less noble intentions than the U.S. working on the same project at the time. There's a good question as to whether the U.S. should have demonstrated it for the Japanese before dropping it on an actual city. I think that's a great question for philosophers. It's a very good question as to whether uh, we did enough in the years immediately after the Second World War to create a body for international control of atomic technology. Uh, that's a great question, but all of them too long to analyze here. <laughs> My name is uh, James Turtelot. Yeah. Okay. My name is Jim, Jim Turtelot. Uh, I uh, have the privilege of Thank you. I've had the, uh, the privilege of uh, serving during the Cold War. I remember well some of the incidents that Mr. Countryman discussed. But what concerns me is more the public mood than the immediate actions of, of the principals. So if we all remember the run-up to the Vietnam War, started with a little made-up incident, go back as far as the Spanish-American War and the blowing up of the Maine. Now we've put all those ships in the South Pacific, and I'm concerned that what we're missing in the equation is um, what the public can do to forestall this uh, used to call it yellow journalism and jingoism, but the, the public support for the kind of bad decision that our uh, principals could make, particularly the present administration. Okay. Well, I, let, me, let me start, and maybe others, um, where is, I want to speak to you. Uh, uh, this is the beginning, okay? I mean, I think before you can, um, the way we, the way I, I was around for the Vietnam period myself, and the response of my um, peers and, and elders was the teaching movement. Because we didn't know, I didn't, we didn't know where Vietnam was, let alone what we were doing there, why we were there, what American foreign policy was. Uh, none of us knew. That is to say, I was an undergraduate in college. Why, why were American soldiers being sent there? 
And the response was the teaching movement before anything else to self-educate ourselves about it. And the more we learned, the more we discovered that this was a tragic mistake and that it, it was not a legitimate use of force, or at least that was the lesson that I took from that experience. I could go on and talk about the heroic people that, that uh, I remember from those days. So I, I think this is part of that kind of effort. I think people are very um, unknowing about the situation in North Korea, and for very good reason. It's, it's a closed place, and U.S. policy has made it very difficult to understand. So the first step is to do what we're doing here, is to self-educate ourselves, and, and then to take it the next step, which is what Jim McGovern is telling us, is to try to introduce legislation that would limit the possibility of military action. But that's, as he said, without public uh, a public response, that's not going to happen. So first, self-education, and then in my view, um, uh, 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 writing letters to the editors so that this education can be more widely heard, uh, um, getting heard in the, in the media, and, uh, and spreading the learning curve that we've heard so well tonight from my colleagues here. I think that's a start. Thank you, please. I'm not sure who to best address this to, but my question is, is there any potential to actually negotiate a peace treaty to replace the current armistice stalemate in the Koreas? And if would doing so have any positive impact on the current situation? Whether we could have a, do you want yeah. to address that? <clears throat> Look, it's certainly possible. Um, what the North Koreans want is, number one, regime survival. Number two, respect from the world and from the United States uh, in the form of a peace treaty that normalizes relationship between North Korea and the rest of the world. Pursuing nuclear weapons as they've been doing, is, in their view, a good way to meet the first goal of regime survival. They vastly misestimate or overestimate the, the way that nuclear weapons could gain them respect in the world. I think they have lost respect in the world, and I think it's important that people tell them that. But in the long run, they're the only conceivable stabilizing solution is one in which either North Korea gives up all nuclear weapons or they are greatly restricted in some way. And in exchange, there is not just an armistice, but a peace treaty and some degree of normalization between North Korea and the U.S. and the rest of the world. And the degree of normalization will be closely calibrated to the degree to which they have denuclearized. Ultimately, we'll get there. It is aggravating that we can't get the process started because both sides agree that the other accept the end point before they even start talking. Thank you so much. I'm sure you may. Yes, Rahul Chokhala. And the uh, panel uh, I'll have a uh, uh, speak mention. Speak sure. OK, my name is Rahul Chokhala. And it's been said that uh, China and Russia has provided technical expertise, and in case of, uh, as well as hardware, to some degree to make the North Korean uh, regime uh, unable, to enable their uh, activity and their advances. And I'll just quickly refer to a study that by Michael Elman, a missile expert at the International Institute of St Strategic Studies, which has very well documented that the rocket parts 
for the current ICPM, uh, the current spurt of success that North Korea has had came from Ukrainian uh, rocket uh, nuclear facility, which had gone defunct uh, recently, but is still within Russian control. And there is an evidence that uh, the newly uh, established ferry system between Vladivostok and uh, North Korea, they may, they may have transported this uh, equipment, a rock, but specifically rocket, uh, to North Korea. And soon after that, there have been a number of uh, successes by North Korea. Given that fact, the Russian role, as well as historical Chinese role, talking about diplomacy, which of course is the only way to solve this issue, unless you make these countries accountable and uh, put their interests at stake, Success, how can you actually expect to just go or uh, continue with the same old diplomacy, tri-party, six-party, at this given sense of urgency where we can see that within weeks, perhaps months, that North Korea will achieve the goal in reaching entire United States and rest of the world? Well, uh Briefly, a couple of points. Uh, absolutely true that North Korea has long run procurement networks, covert and overt, to buy up technology wherever they can if it's applicable to missile or nuclear technology. And they have done that whether or not the government in which the procurement network was operating approved of it. There's been too much tolerance and crappy export controls by both China and Russia uh, but it, I don't think would be correct to say that China and Russia built the missiles for them. They knew what they were doing. Secondly, I kind of wish that this were the only big problem that we had with China or we had with Russia. But the fact is, we have a lot of other problems with both countries. Uh, and I think that the other issues for which the United States is now appropriately sanctioning Russia, such as the invasion and occupation of Ukraine, uh, are uh, the appropriate topics that should be in the center of U.S.-Russia discussion. Third, I don't, uh, China has an extremely important role to play in the ultimate solution of North Korea. Russia does not. Uh, I'm sorry to offend all my Russian friends, but Russia is no longer a, a superpower. The only two areas in which it is a superpower are nuclear weapons and creative computer programming. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, we're glad to see you on the line. Hi, I'm Kelsey Whiting Jones. Thank you all for being here. I have a million questions, and one which I definitely want to ask maybe later about military to military deconfliction options, given that inadvertent or accidental war is probably the most likely um, risk that we're facing. Um, but I'd like to throw out more of a creative question. Um, given that you all are students or practitioners of diplomacy, if you did have access to surrogates on either side, um, the US and North Korea, um, how would you get them to initiate talks about talks? Given that the temperatures are quite high, how would you lower the temperatures, whether it might be a cultural diplomacy move, an economic diplomacy move? I'd love to hear your ideas. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, where's the person who asked the question? Oh, there you are. Hi. Uh, there, are, there are, in fact, efforts underway. Um, I'm just forgetting the name of the person in the organization. Maybe you know that she spoke at our, uh, uh, you were on the same panel. Was it Suzanne DiMaggio? Or? Yes. Yeah. Could you, uh, you say more? Well, uh, there's, uh, there's something that are, is called Track 2 Diplomacy, or sometimes it's called Track 1.5. Track 1 is government to government. Track 2 is a bunch of old farts like me, retired diplomats or generals, 
meeting their counterparts from another country. I'm going to go do that a couple months from now with some retired Russian <coughs> diplomats in Geneva, for example. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, and occasionally it produces something useful. Uh, in the case of North Korea, we do, uh, there is a practice of doing what's called Track 1.5. There's no such thing as a retired North Korean. It doesn't exist. Uh, but you can have retired diplomats or professors or think tankers who sit down with uh, authorized <coughs> officials from the North Korean Foreign <coughs> Ministry. And uh, they've done this several times just in the last year. And I just read an interview, I, I'll remember in a moment what the publication was, that describes these last few 1.5 discussions. They're especially important for North Korea uh, because when the president is undercutting track one negotiations saying they're a waste of time, they at least help the North Koreans to understand what are the realities and the constraints in Washington even under this very different administration. That's important. And they may help to get the real track one negotiators to agree on a way to just start talking. Not overthink it, not overdefine what are the conditions, but just start talking. So, so, I find, oh. it, it's Sus, Suzanne DiMaggio. Suzanne DiMaggio. And so if you, if you uh, look her name up, you will find out about this effort, which is quite serious, as some countrymen has said. So there, there, there are efforts to do that. There's, and Dennis will say something in a minute. I'm sorry, I no, cut you off. There, there is also something going on. There, there, there is a North Korean delegation to the United Nations. We have no, U.S. has no direct diplomatic ties with the North, but the North does have a delegation to the United Nations in New York City. And there's been some communication between that office and the special representative of the president uh, with them. So if, if, if there was a will to move things forward, there are mechanisms there. Well, yeah, no, that's quite all right. Um, one of the um, interesting developments about the crisis this time around, and maybe it happened before, but I'm just not aware of it, um, is that, and maybe this goes back to the theme I raised at the beginning, which is that the farther away, the more um, you know, frightened of North Korea you are, and that may also end in taking steps from afar. What I've noticed, for example, is that there are more um, proposals for talks and for mediation coming from uh, far away, uh, the European Union, for example. Uh, Angela Merkel uh, proposed um, heading talks uh, with the uh, UN Security Council, the P5 plus one, this time, you know, which is the Iran negotiation model. But she, uh, you know, offered to host that meeting uh, or that uh, process. Also, <clears throat> uh, what's interesting, and this is probably not for negotiations, but the North Atlantic Treaty Organization um, is getting more and more uh, involved with North Korea. Uh, the Secretary General Stoltenberg visited uh, Japan and Korea before Trump went there. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure that's a, a great uh, you know, way to moderate the crisis because basically um, he's saying, uh, he said that uh, NATO is not really a regional organization, it's not global, and its interests are global. Um, the other um, aspect is something that uh, my class and I have been uh, talking about or will be, and that is, for the, I think for one of the first times, the foreign minister uh, of North Korea uh, approached the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the Southeast Asian Nations through President Duterte uh, of the Philippines. Um, and um, certainly from the region, the Southeast Asian region, you'll, if, you know, that's all in English, you can find 
a lot of commentary on whether or not uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations can play a role in mediating uh, a lot of the problems in East Asia. I mean, I think a lot of people are doubtful, but if there is one organization in the Asia, Indo-Asia Pacific region that has built uh, a network of organizations that uh, deal with economic security and political issue, it is the 10 countries of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, North Korea is a member of the uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, the ARF, and that is the only uh, regional organization that North Korea is a member of, and that, that is an organization that was uh, set up to discuss regional security issues. So, you know, there are mechanisms out there um, that, you know, I don't know how many of them are credible. Uh, you know, so many people would not count on um, the Southeast Asians to be able to do anything. But, um, you know, the mechanisms are out there, and it seems to me that this time around the North Koreans are actually searching for outlets. Thank you so much. Friends, I want to say that it is our intention to close at 9 p.m., so we are going to ask, have these people ask their questions, and nobody else probably should get on the line, because we will get through the folks that are lined up, lined up now, because we're going to close at 9. So, yes, please, sir. Uh, my name is Alex Mozell. I'm a grad student at UMass. I have a two-part question, but it's really quick. Uh, first of all, uh, what is what is the time frame by which North Korea could destroy the entire United States versus what is the time frame by which we might have a missile interception system with near-perfect success? <laughs> they're, they're both infinite. Um, Neither will happen in your lifetime or mine. Uh, the, I just want to build on, on one point that Dennis made about how freaked out you are, depending on how far you are uh, from the action. As I said, 50 years ago, there were serious people in Washington who said we had to attack China and destroy their nuclear capability before their they begin building nuclear weapons because that guy Mao Zedong is a fanatic and a crazy man. Uh, it was very much the same debate as is happening today. It just was not as public mm -hmm. as is happening today. And yet we learned to live with China possessing several hundred nuclear weapons primarily aimed at the United States on long-range, intercontinental, accurate ballistic missiles. Do you worry about that every day? No. Neither do the newspapers. It is politically impossible for nearly any politician, but especially this president, to say out loud, we can learn to live with North Korea in possession of a few nuclear weapons and absolutely deterred by our overwhelming conventional and nuclear force. That's a rational statement. It's what we do with China and Russia. But it is not politically possible for anybody to say that out loud today. Uh, let me just leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. My name is Brian Arante, and I think this question will be directed to the professor, professor at Smith. I believe your name is uh, Dennis. Is that, uh, it appears that North Korea always seems to react to something that the United States does, and I think China has brought this up, is that every time we have military drills, with either Japan or especially South Korea, then that's when they start going sort of like uh, paranoid and shoot up a missile. Does it make sense to just stop these military drills? I mean, we, we have North Korea in check. I mean, what can they do? I mean, what is the point of doing this unless our leaders are looking for another Pearl Harbor, which is to instigate a conflict, wait for them to make a mistake? So this, and also the threat of sanctions, I don't see, uh, I agree with Jimmy Carter when he says the sanctions hurt the people at the bottom. If you take a look at their leader, 
he, he's doing quite well. He weighs about 300 pounds, and he, I don't think he's going to suffer from the sanctions, but the sanctions hurt the people at the bottom of the system. So the point I'm trying to make is these threats keep on escalating uh, matters, and is anybody you know, understanding this and doing something to send mediators over there? I think we can do better than Dennis Rodman. And you know, <laughs> when he went over there, the people start to calm down. And so that is my basic question is, uh, uh, can we stop the threats and start the mediation process? Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> I think the issue of joint military operations has been raised a number of times as part of a solution. Um, in other words, that was one of the endpoints, the negotiating points. You know, if you can put together a package that includes um, stopping. Um, the joint military operations and eventually envision the United States withdrawing from South Korea. That is one of the roads to uh, a solution. I think the others can speak to it as well. Um, the, the problem there is that um, joint military operations have become the new norm uh, in the region. Uh, I'm sure China would like to see them stop too because they see a lot of that uh, aimed at them as well. Um, I mean, you have, um, you know, uh, the ideas, uh, I mean, India has become a major player now in that area, too. Uh, and, you know, you've heard about the, this um, idea about the Quad, you know, with the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. Um, they're not really going to stop uh, military operations. So I think the U.S. will probably continue it, and North Korea will always assume that it's a part of the reason for doing that is uh, that it's aimed at them. Um, it's interesting, by the way, I I'm fascinated by this because the Quad idea is uh, attributed to the Japanese, you know, that it was a security diamond um, that was proposed by the Japanese Prime Minister. Only if you go back and read the security diamond, it's the uh, India, Australia, Japan, and Hawaii. <laughs> you know, and, and I'm wondering, um, you know, Hawaii. You know, I didn't think Hawaii had a, uh, you know, a military. Uh, but the other thing of it is, it really didn't come from Japan. It came from George W. Bush. I mean, it was originally an American idea. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, yeah, you can put it on the table, but I'm not sure how far that was. I, I do. I do want to add something to to that um, question, and, and that is, if we're going to ask North Korea to do something to give up something, the U.S. is going to have to agree to something as well. There has to be something on each side of the table, and one of the things that has been suggested is is to at least a reduction in some of these drills, which the North Koreans find very threatening. So th this has to be put on the table. Uh, we, we can't ask North Korea, if we're going to have negotiations, we can't ask North Korea to give up everything and nothing on our side. So if, if not this, then what? So we have to, we have to be creative and think about what, what, what on our side we can um, safely agree to do that'll give some assurance to the North that uh, they will, if they cut back, if they reduce their nuclear capability, we're not going to take advantage of it immediately and move to attack the regime and wipe them out. So that, that, that there has to be some way to give them assurances, security assurances, that they can reduce their level of capability uh, without incurring greater risk. Thank you. Tim. Hello, my name is Tim Wallace from Northampton, and I'd like to thank you all for the for the contributions. And I and I would just like to ask the panel if if you could all respond to the comment that uh, Jim McGovern made on the video about um, ultimately moving to get rid of all nuclear weapons, because you mentioned. For instance, just now about China um, having having the same uh, threat, you know, 50 years ago. All these other countries. If we go beyond North Korea, what does this look like in the in the longer term? If if all our only our only response to countries trying to develop nuclear weapons is to is to threaten them and try to get them to stop, when we've got more and more countries all over the world wanting to do this. Thanks. 
think that's a question for Tom. Yeah. yeah um, um, well, several points. I was very proud of President Obama and his speech in Prague in 2009 when he said the ultimate goal must be a world free of nuclear weapons. He acknowledged how tough that was going to be, but he laid out very practical steps that brought us a little bit closer. He was building upon ideas that were generated not by some fuzzy liberals in western Massachusetts, but by <laughs> some determined cold warriors, the group of Henry Kissinger, George Schultz, Bill Perry, Sam Nunn, sat down together and talked about how you get to global zero and made specific proposals that will take a long time, decades, to achieve. But at least we were making the steps in the right direction, and I was, it was the biggest honor I had as a, a diplomat to be a little part of those ambitious goals that the president set for achievement sometime in the future. It is, of course, disappointing that this administration is walking back from those goals and deriding the idea that you could ever get to global zero, or at least deciding we won't talk about it anymore. Uh, we'll see what they come up with in the nuclear posture review that is likely to come out in January, how big of a backward step it is. Uh, and of course the problem with those backward steps, whether they are taken by Moscow or Washington or someone else, is exactly what you said. They encourage others to think, huh, those bastards are never going to give up all their nuclear weapons. We have to rethink our commitment to not having nuclear weapons. I don't think there are very many countries beyond Iran that are actively thinking about nuclear, uh, getting nuclear weapons, but that could change if the signals you send are wrong. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, please. Henry Heafy from Northampton. Thank you all for a great evening. I think, Dr. Clare, your, some of your comments raised a question on my mind. We read a lot and hear a lot about hacking and cyber attacks on our country. Do we have the capability of cyber attacks and hacking to slow down or stop the development of nuclear weapons in North Korea um, going the other way? Yeah, and, and I'm not an expert on this topic, and maybe my panelists, co-panelists, know more than I do. Uh, certainly, uh, their attempts have been made to do this by the Obama administration. That was part of their strategy uh, to disrupt the launching of missiles by the North, and that we know, that's public. I think it's safe to assume that there were covert operations of a, of a cyber nature that were not reported. So the answer is certainly yes, that uh, attempts have been made and were used to do that. Uh, but uh, what's evident from the pace of testing, this is my understanding, maybe Tom knows more, my understanding is that the Koreans, after a while, figured out that they were under attack, and they're no dummies when it comes to cyber warfare, uh, that they found out how to protect themselves from these kinds of attacks. And so have been able to speed up their testing of ballistic missiles. That is my best understanding of the situation that you asked. Unless Tom wants to add anything to that? No. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much. And this is our final question. We ask you to be brief. I'm John Stifler. I live in Northampton. Uh, I'll keep the question real simple. Probably for Mr. Countryman. Everything you're saying, everything you guys are saying makes sense to me. To what extent do you think Republicans in Congress are listening to it and doing anything about it? <laughs> I don't know. I grew up in the Catholic Church, and they always told me to pray for the souls of the fallen, so you, you never yeah. know. <laughs> the, uh, uh, look, it's a, uh, um, I'm, I can't analyze 
all of Washington for you. Uh, nobody can. There is a, obviously a terrible tension within the Republican Party about the degree to which they stick with traditionally defined conservative Republican values, uh, or do they follow a leader who has abandoned most, if not all, of those values uh, for the sake of uh, immediate benefit, immediate political benefit. Uh, as a consequence, there are very few members of Congress, majority members of Congress in the Senate and maybe even fewer in the House who are still thinking about these tough questions. But there are some. And they deserve respect and encouragement. And the single best example was a hearing that occurred yesterday for the first time since 1976. There was a hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee about the President's authority when it comes to ordering the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, it was a good hearing. I don't think it solved anything, but it's the first time that Congress actively discussed that issue in 40 years. And I want to give Senator Corker, the chairman of the committee, great credit. Uh, for bringing that up. It, it's an example of the kind of people who in a uh, uh, through the looking glass kind of Congress uh, is willing to focus on the issues that are very much in the here and now. And uh, uh, I think he's the best example I can give of such a man. I'm, I'm going to add one comment to, to this about the Republicans. Um, as, as uh, Tom Countryman indicated, the Trump administration is conducting what's called a nuclear posture re review, or NPR, funny combination of <laughs> letters. Uh, we're all devoted NPR listeners. Uh, this is probably gonna come out in January, and we don't know the contents yet, but in all likelihood, it will call for the acceleration of a nuclear modernization that began under the Obama administration, or at least the early steps. And uh, the Congressional Budget Office uh, a week or so ago released a report that uh, as planned, this is before the NPR comes out, as, as planned in the Obama scheme, uh, would cost, without inflation, uh, $1.2 trillion over a 30-year period. This is to modernize the three legs of the strategic triad, which is land-based ICBMs, uh, sea-launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs, and uh, heavy bombers, strategic bombers, carrying cruise missiles and bombs. Uh, $1.2 trillion with uh, inflation and cost overruns, at least one and a half trillion dollars. Uh, now, there are Republicans in Congress who say, at least, that uh, you know they want to lower taxes. We know that, uh, but they're also concerned about the deficit, looming deficit, and other concerns. And historically, Republicans were worried about the heavy costs of some of these ballooning weapon systems and whether they're necessary or not. So this, in my mind, is an area where uh, I, I think efforts can be made to uh, reach Republicans who may not, you know, be want to uh, work with us on, on disarmament per se, but who can be reached around the question of exceedingly costly, unnecessary nuclear weapons. Before we thank our panelists for their contributions this evening, um, I'm going to invite any of you who would like to make a brief closing moment, um, something you want to send us off with, or anything you would like to add before we thank you for your very, very fine and informative presentations this evening. Would, Tom, would you like to begin? Um, you all know Adam Smith, no? Uh, Adam Smith happens to be the congressman from my hometown, Tacoma, Washington. 
and uh, not to be confused with Adam Schiff of California. Uh, but Adam Smith introduced today in the House one of the shortest resolutions ever. It simply says, it is the policy of the United States not to be the first to use nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it will ever come to a vote, but it's kind of the shortest and certainly the sweetest thing I've seen in a congressional resolution. I'm sure uh, Congressman Govern loves it, but you can get other folks to love it too. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you so much. Dennis, would you like to share uh, Well, one thing, um, two, just two things. One thing I would like to see the U.S. do is to sign all of the international <laughs> agreements that they haven't ratified yet, including the law of the sea and things of that nature. It would help, I think, especially if we're, you know, if we're saying we're going to enforce uh, the rule of law when we haven't even recognized a lot of them that are in existence. Um, on a personal note, um, I'm very encouraged by the turnout and your interest in an issue that is so important, not only globally, uh, but an issue that reaches right down to the local level. And I know that there are times when a lot of us feel somewhat helpless. Um, you know, I talked about other countries and what they're doing, and you have your fingers crossed and you hope that, you know, they do good things, but you're never sure. But I think uh, I feel much more reassured that um, at the local level here in this country, and I think we could feel it now, um, we're not going to forget that there is a stake involved here, not just globally, but also locally. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Michael? Oh, I'm just so glad to see so many people here tonight. But uh, I, I want to thank Elizabeth Silver. Would you please stand, Elizabeth? Right in here. Elizabeth has, has did a, an awful lot of the work to make this happen, and we're so grateful that you did this. Thank you. Thank you. Can we thank our